his word on this Christmas Sunday. Lord, we come to you this morning, and Father, we're so grateful for, and we've enjoyed everything that has been part of this day. And Lord, we know that as we have sung praises to you this morning, it has pleased your heart. From the smallest child to the oldest one among us, we have sung praises to you, just as the angelic choirs sang that night when you left heaven and you came to earth. And Lord, it, our hearts are touched and we are moved as we join them and as we consider that we too are part of praising your name. Now, Lord, we want to praise your name by turning to your word and listening to your word and responding to your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I want to talk uh, this morning about, for just a little while, not a, not a long time, because as you can see, if you look at your watches, we've got about 35 minutes, and I'll, I'll keep it in that time. And at the end, we'll sing again just a little bit. Um, and we're going to pray for one another as well. Um, here on this joyous Christmas celebration this Sunday, and then next Sunday as well, we know that there are those among us who are carrying heavy burdens this morning. Um, so there are needs here in Hong Kong. Some of you are thinking of needs that that are in your home countries if you're not from Hong Kong. You look over here and, and look at that. Priscilla is sitting in Pastor Renee's seat this morning. You know he's not going to like that, but as you know, he won't mind. He, he loves, he loves uh, visitors and loves guests. And Pastor Renee is in Queen Elizabeth Hospital this morning, um, but he's recovering well. We're going to pray for him at the end. For those of you that didn't know, he had an episode with his heart in the middle of the week, but he went to Queen Elizabeth and Queen Elizabeth has the best cardiac care unit in Hong Kong. So we praise the Lord for that. But we know that there are other needs as well this morning. So at the end of the service, we're going to pray. But as we come to that point, I want to talk about the longest journey this Christmas. Um, as I was preparing, I was thinking about some of the themes of Christmas. And for me, because of my background as, a, as an English teacher and as a literature teacher, I sometimes look at things a, perhaps a little bit differently than, than, uh, than some of you may. And the Lord brings all of us into his church and we have different ways of looking at things. And so I was looking at it a little bit more as an English teacher for a while. I was looking at some of these symbols and themes. And I was thinking about the journeys that are part of Christmas. And... Um, I was thinking back to some of the early journeys when I first came, when I first came to this part of the world, when I first came to Asia, uh, my very first year, a long time ago before many of you were born, I was in northern China in the city of Changchun, uh, the land of, uh, the, the city of eternal spring or everlasting spring. And for me to get from Changchun to Hong Kong in those days, that was in the 80s, uh, I would take the fast train, but the fast train took me from Changchun to Beijing, and that was about 24 hours, at least, at least. That was if it was really fast and it didn't stop, you know, it didn't have unusual breakdowns. And then from Beijing to Guangzhou, it was 37 hours, right? And then from Guangzhou to Hong Kong, then you had to go to another train station, and then you had to take the through train, and it was about another five hours more. So you would travel for days um, to get to Hong Kong. Uh, and as I was preparing yesterday, I went back online, and I looked at uh, the bullet train now from Beijing to Hong Kong, Kowloon West Station. Do you know how long it takes to get from Beijing to Hong Kong to Kowloon West Station on the bullet train? Nine hours, nine hours. I couldn't believe it. I thought, what? I, I used to give days of my life for that. It was a long journey, and now it can be done in nine hours. And um, I'm sure if I were to ask most of you about some of your long journeys, Gloria, I think that's an easy one. Gloria, how long did it take you to get from UK back to Hong Kong this time? 12 hours? Twelve hours? Ah, nothing. <laughs> As I was coming back this time from the U.S. back here after being with mom and dad for, this, for the last month, uh, Delta changed Delta the airlines. I'm sure Cathay Pacific's better. Um, Delta Airlines changed my flight schedule and they changed some of their flight schedules. And I received this message that my flight had been changed. And I thought, hmm, okay, usually it's five minutes. Imagine my horror when I found out that a trip that usually takes me 21 hours with all of the stops and that's good. This time took me 30 plus hours. 
So I, there is a course, there's time change, but I left the US Thursday evening. I arrived in Hong Kong Saturday, the middle of the day. It was kind of awful, but I, I was glad to be back. So I was thinking about these long journeys and how I'd prepared for them. And um, I was thinking about long journeys in relation to Christmas, because there's some long journeys related to Christmas. And, uh, and this is not the long journey that Santa Claus takes around the world, giving toys to all the good boys and girls. Um, the really, truly the long journeys of Christmas. And the one that comes to mind immediately is this one. And we know this one so well, don't we? From Luke chapter two, from the Christmas story, verses one through six. Most of us know this, many of us could quote this, couldn't we? Uh, I've told you before, but when I was growing up, Christmas Eve, our family would sit around and we would read this story and we soon learned it. So a decree goes out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. Uh, that sounds nice and it sounds quite benign, but the reason there was a registration was so that they could be, if they were Romans, they could be put in the army if need be, and so if they were not Romans, they could be taxed. So they wanted, they wanted to know who's part, uh, who's part of, the, who's part of our, our empire. And so there was, a, there was a, uh, a census that took place. So everyone, verse three, went to be registered each to his own town. And we come to verse four and it's just a few words. And Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family line of David, to be registered with Mary who was engaged to him and was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. When I plan for a long trip, I think about, uh, I, I start planning weeks in advance. I have a pile in one corner and I start thinking about what clothes I'm going to wear and I start putting the clothes on the pile. The paperwork that I need, the paperwork goes on the pile. Oh, I need these toiletries, that goes on the pile. And then I think about who will water my plants, who will take care of my kitty cats, um, I know that doesn't touch some of your hearts at all, but it touches my heart. I think about these things, and I think about all the, the planning. So I was thinking about how Joseph and Mary planned for that trip. They knew that it was coming, but there would not have been a lot of preparation because life was very simple at that time. They didn't have a lot of clothes to wear. They would have had one outer garment. Maybe their inner garments, they would have had more than one. They would have carried all the food they needed for their journey. And it was a long journey because to get from where they were in Nazareth to Bethlehem, where they were supposed to register, um, was about, it would have taken up to 10 days. It was about, oh, close to 90, it was close to 90 miles. And for a pregnant woman traveling at that time, we always show it on a donkey, don't we? All the Christmas cards, do your Christmas cards have Mary and Joseph and Mary's on a donkey? Well, where did that come from? We don't know where it came from because the Bible doesn't say they had a donkey. They may have had a donkey, but Mary may have walked. But certainly in her state of pregnancy, hey, Jocelyn. <laughs> I'd like to see Jocelyn walking for 10 days. Ying says, no way, I'll carry her. <laughs> Ying says, I'll be the donkey, <laughs> right? But we, we think about that. It was a long journey for them. It was certainly not one that they would have chosen to take. Perhaps she rode. She would have been far along in her pregnancy. It would have been tiring and difficult. They would have gone through areas where there were bandits on the road. They would have gone through areas where there were wild animals. And you say, what wild animals in Israel today or in Palestine? There would have been lions, bears, and wild boars. That was known, they were, they were known to be those things at that time. If it had been in warm weather, which is what some people think, then it would have been really, really hot in the daytime. If it had been in the winter season or the cold season, there would have been rain much of the time and it would have been freezing at night and they would have slept out of doors. It would have been a miserable journey. Now some of us have taken miserable journeys before, haven't we? And we've thought, when will this end? It was a miserable journey. But they had little choice in the matter because Joseph and Mary were Jews living in occupied territory. 
And as I was thinking about that and this long trip they had to take, I want to ask you something this morning as we think about Joseph and Mary, because I'm not interested in a history lesson. Um, if we want a history lesson, we can go back to university and take a history class. But I'm interested in this as it relates to us this morning, because I think we see something here this morning. How many of you in your life and in your circumstances have ever been forced to do something or make a decision that you did not want to, that was displeasing to you, that if you'd had the power, you would not have done it. You would have chosen something else, but you didn't have the power to, right? You were forced to make this decision. You were forced to do what you did not want to do. That was certainly the case with Mary and Joseph. And yet, as we look at the Christmas story, we see that God perfectly orchestrated unwanted circumstances for his purpose. And that encourages me this morning, and it should encourage you this morning as well, because our God is not dismayed by unwanted circumstances. How many of you this morning are struggling with unwanted circumstances? There's something in your life or in your family. It's not good. You don't like it and you don't want it and you'd change it if you could. All of us would say that. Nevertheless, nevertheless, God is still in control and God is still at work and God can still bring his plan to fruition out of unwanted and unpleasant circumstances. That should encourage you this morning. It really should. It really should. And you may say, yes, but I don't see it yet. And you don't know how hard this is and how miserable this is. I kind of think of Joseph and Mary in the same way as they were trudging along the dusty road, um, wondering how long will this take and when will it end. It's a little bit like us if we're dealing with circumstances that are similar to that. Because at the end of that, God had something good. God had something perfect. God had something that was completely part of his plan. And that should give you hope this morning. And it should give me hope this morning too, because I'm struggling with some things also. We look at the timing and the circumstances that were not of their choice, but were perfectly orchestrated by God to bring his son Jesus into the world. It was a perfect fulfillment of prophecy from Jeremiah 600 years earlier, from Micah 700 years earlier, from Isaiah 800 years earlier, and from Genesis 1400 years before Jesus was born. Wow. We should be encouraged this morning. We should be encouraged. And as we see this, we're reminded in this long journey that Joseph and Mary took, God was still sovereign in unwanted and unpleasant circumstances. But that's not the only long journey. There's another long journey too. And this journey was longer than Joseph and Mary's journey. What was this journey? This was the journey of the wise men or the magi. Or as we sing in the song, we three kings of Orient are. Well, were they Orient? We don't know. Were they kings? We don't know. Were they three? We don't know. Some of, you, some of us from our church background, backgrounds, we would say, and I know their names, right? I, I, you know, it's not my church background, but I looked it up yesterday. I thought, oh, Casper, Melchior, and something like that. There you go, see? But in fact, brothers and sisters, this is, we don't know what their names were. We don't know exactly where they were from. We don't know how many they were. Uh, every Christmas card shows them riding on a what? A camel. By all accounts, a very unpleasant mode of transport. Um, but in fact, they may not have been on camels at all. If they came from where many people think they came from, they would have been 
riding probably horses instead because horses were what wealthy and what kings rode as well. And that may have been what they were. So we see this in Matthew 2, 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in, of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men came from the east, arriving unexpectedly in Jerusalem. And so that's where we get the we three kings of Orient are. It's the east, right? But there are a lot of easts, aren't there? Um, and they said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. Well, how long was their journey? It was definitely longer than 10 days, but depending on where they were from, their journey may have been several months, and it was likely several months. What prompted their journey? It was an astronomical sign. Now, I sometimes refer to Letty, who's not here this morning. I think she's with Kenneth this morning. Um, where's Letty? Oh, I'm so sorry. Letty, there you are. Letty, were you looking at the skies this weekend? No, because it was? She was sick. Had she not been sick, Letty would have been looking at the skies for the Geminid meteor shower. That's one of the greatest of the year. And some of you are saying, what? That's because you're not interested in astronomy. Um, but these wise men, by all accounts, they're called wise men, uh, or magi, they were interested in the stars, they were interested in astronomy, or we would also say what we would today call astrology. So it was a mix of things. And they believed that the stars ordered the lives of people. And there are people who still believe that today, right? When they go to the newspaper and they read their horoscope. Forget it, folks. Um, <laughs> Jesus orders your life <laughs> if you're his child. But they had, it was a mixture of science and other things as well. And uh, they had seen an astronomical sign. It may have been a star. And those of you that have studied astronomy, you would say, a star cannot do that. Well, it can if God tells the star what to do. If the creator of the universe is in charge, he can make his creation do anything, can't he? So that's why I don't have problems with things like this. But... So they saw a sign, a star, or something that they described as a star. Were they from China? Some people think they were from China because China had a very well-developed system, a science of astronomy at that time. India, also from the east of Jerusalem, had a very well-developed uh, uh, astronomical science at that time. But there was another place that um, had a well-developed astronomical science, and that was around the area of Babylon. And as we look at this and we think about the journey, one of the things that makes this even more interesting is that the word magi, which is where we get this from, it's an old Iranian word, and it's from that area. And probably most Bible scholars believe the wise men came from either Babylon or in the area around Babylon. Do you know why they believe that? Because of history, and also because they look at biblical history. Who was in Babylon many, many years earlier who was a wise man and given wisdom by God? Years earlier, who? Daniel. Who was given dreams and understanding? Daniel. Who was considered one of the wise men and one of the magi that instructed the king? Daniel. Who knew the prophecies and the timing of when the Messiah would come? Daniel. Daniel. And so a lot of Bible scholars believe that Daniel, through prophetic revelation from God, was the one hundreds of years earlier that gave the wisdom of God to people, who, to magi who lived, and it was passed from generation to generation. And if that's so, then the journey would have taken several months to get there because they knew that it was somewhere in Judea. And they said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We've seen his star. Well, why didn't they go directly to Bethlehem? Because there are prophecies that say it was in Bethlehem, right? In Micah, in the Old Testament uh, book of Micah, it says it's in Bethlehem. So if these wise men really got their wisdom handed down from Daniel to that time, why didn't they know Bethlehem? Because that prophecy came many, many, many years 
after Daniel was gone. And so they came to Judea. And so we look at this and we see, if that is true, we see again the hand of our sovereign God at work in history at work in history, down through the ages. And that gives us hope also, because I don't know about you, I look at current events around me. You all know that I am from North America, that I'm American. So I'll be really honest with you. I look at current events in my country, and my heart is saddened and made heavy. And I look at what is said, and I look at what is done, and I look at these things, and my heart is grieved when I look at the history of the present history of my country. And some of you may feel the same thing about your countries as well. And you may look at things and you say, this is not good, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, and why are these things happening? And yet our Lord is still the sovereign Lord of history. He can orchestrate everything. We looked at Joseph and Mary, and we said, what preparation did they make for their long journey? And it was very little preparation. But what preparation did the Magi, the wise men, make? They made a preparation of gifts. And as we see, verse 11, entering the house, because this time it would have been months later, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. By the way, may I give you a footnote right here? Anytime you read about the child and his mother in the New Testament... Do you know who's always first? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the center. Jesus is the star. Jesus is the focus. And they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. And they opened their treasures. You heard Jeremy read that this morning, didn't you? He came up to me before the service and said, Pastor Jennifer, uh, how do I say this word? <laughs> and they said, and how do I say this word? Um, and we know it's gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we have this beautiful picture of prophecy, even in the gifts that the wise men gave. Uh, because frankincense, with gold, gold was what was given to what? A king. You know, when the wise men came traveling those many months, I wonder what they expected to find. I'm sure they did not expect to find an un, a little child in a very simple house without a lot of things around him. And yet they brought a gift of gold because he was a king and would be crowned king one day. What else did they bring? They brought frankincense. Why did they bring frankincense? Frankincense is incense that is used in holy worship. And it was a sign and a prophecy about Jesus who was divine, Jesus who was God, Jesus who was God. And then they brought myrrh. And why was myrrh brought? Oh, they, they were just bringing precious things. But why did they bring myrrh? Why did the Holy Spirit prompt them to bring myrrh? Because myrrh was what was used to anoint a body. And it was a sign that Jesus was not just divine and God but that he was God in the flesh. He was a human, just like you, and just like me. And there was prophecy in their very gifts. And they came a long way to worship him and to bow down. He's the God of history, and he orchestrates history. But that's not the longest journey, is it? What's the longest journey at Christmas time? The longest journey at Christmas time is Jesus, when he came from heaven to earth. And in the few minutes remaining, we've got about 15, 10, 15 minutes this morning as we come. I want us to end with, in, these, in this last part of the service, looking at the longest journey of all, and that's Jesus, as he came from heaven to earth. And we might say, well, Pastor Jennifer, what kind of journey is that? It was in an instant he left heaven and he was born. I think there's more than one type of journey, isn't there? And we read in Galatians 4, 4, When the completion of time had come, the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, 
and born under the law. And I want us to think in these few minutes that remain this morning about how far Jesus traveled from heaven to earth to you and to me. When was the last time you read Revelation 21 and 22? Most of us avoid the book of Revelation, right? There's all this judgment and there's the Antichrist and, and, these, and there's the terrible things happening on the earth. May I encourage you, go to chapter 21 and 22 and read about heaven and what heaven is like. In these chapters, we read about streets of gold, jeweled walls, a crystal clear river of life that brings healing, the great tree of life. And some of us would say, yeah, but that's not real. Well, the Bible talks about it, and it points to Jesus. It's a land of no shadows or pain or suffering. It's a perfect place, and it's a peaceful place of light and life. But here, here that first Christmas, that night, was a dirty, smelly cave with dung on the floors. Do you know how awful you and I feel if we're walking on the street and we step in something that has been left on the street? And you say, Pastor Jennifer, you're being a little bit irreverent. I don't think so. This is real. There was dung on the floors in this cave. It stank. It was dark. How long was the journey from perfect heaven to such a place. The light of heaven was replaced by a tiny flickering olive oil lamp, if there was even that that night, or perhaps a candle. It was a long journey. In place of angel choirs, the only sounds would have been perhaps a cow chewing its cud, sheep bleating, who knows. In heaven, everyone knew him. He was the Son, the only Son, the one who held creation together, the one who created the world, and now the Creator had become the created. It was a long journey, brothers and sisters. It was a long journey. In heaven, all heaven knew him, all heaven honored him and worshiped him. But here, here on this dark night, in a tiny, insignificant town. He was born as the child of an insignificant teenage girl and supposedly a poor carpenter. And he was so unimportant that the best they could find for him was a manger out of which animals ate. Jesus traveled a very long journey from heaven to get to us. In heaven, Everything was his. On earth we are told that he had no home of his own. He borrowed a boat to cross a lake. He borrowed a donkey to ride into Jerusalem. And in death, he was laid in a borrowed tomb. But his journey was far greater than gold of heaven to the poverty of earth because the Bible tells us you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich for your sakes, yet for your sakes he became poor so that by his poverty he could make you rich. That's a long journey, brothers and sisters, isn't it? That's a long journey. What he had to what we didn't have so that we might have what was his. His journey was from God to man, from perfect life to a criminal's death. And we read, now here's a Christmas passage for you, brothers and sisters. I'm only reading part of it. You go, you go back and read more of it. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Wow, what would you and I do if we had a superpower, right? Think about it that way. Think of the things that we would do for ourselves and, and so on. Instead, he stripped himself of his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he had appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. 
It was a long journey, wasn't it? It was a long journey. And in perfect timing, from creator to created being, from God to man, when we were utterly helpless at just the right time, right? Some, some Bible translations say at just the right time. Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. It was a long journey for Jesus. It was a long journey for Jesus. And he traveled from, from, from being one with God to being someone on whom God could not even look because of our sin. But because of that, this morning, you and I can be friends of God. We read a little bit earlier in Galatians 4, at just the right time, God sent forth his son. And it's really important for us to remember why this morning he did send his son. It's important for us to remember why Jesus took a long journey. Joseph and Mary were forced to take their long journey. The wise men chose because they wanted to go find the new king and worship the new king. And Jesus also chose. And why did he choose? God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. This Christmas, as we think about the journey that Jesus took, I want you to think about it in this way. Jesus took the longest journey that anyone could take to us so that we may take the shortest journey back to him. You may think this morning, I feel so far from God. He, he feels so far away. I, I'm, I'm so distant. I've done so much. Or you may even feel like, well, I'm a Christian, but ah, oh, my life is such a mess these days. I've got so many things wrong. How can God understand? How can God know what I'm going through? And what we've looked at this morning reminds us that that can never be said about God, brothers and sisters. He took that journey so that he would know exactly what we're going through, so that he would feel what we feel, so that not only could he feel. Have you ever gone through something and it encouraged you for somebody to feel sympathy for you, you know? for somebody to come beside you and say, I I'm, I'm so sorry, I know. Sometimes people just say, I'm so sorry. At other times, people have gone through the same thing and they say, I know what you're going through. Um, and I've said that to some of you and some of you have said that to me. But with Jesus, because he took the longest journey, he goes one step further for you and for me. Not only does he feel sympathy, not only has he gone through the things that we go through, he has the power and the ability and the desire to make a difference in our lives and to carry the burden and to lift the burden and to give hope and to give life and to forgive when we feel like I can't be forgiven. I've done too much. I don't want anybody to know. He already knows and he says, I can do something about it. He took the long journey so that we can take the shortest journey of all which is just as short as just saying Jesus, because he's here. He's Emmanuel, and he's God with us. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand. The choir's going to, uh, the, sorry, not the choir, the worship team. I think we're going to sing Jesus Saves, aren't we? So just the worship team. Just stand, would you stand with me this morning? But before we sing, I don't want to circumvent the work of the Holy Spirit this morning, and I want to pray for you this morning. I know this morning that in this group, some of you are struggling and you're suffering. Some of you have family situations that are breaking your heart right now. Yes? Yes. Some of you have burdens and you think, I don't know what to do about this. I don't know how to change. May I say to you right now, that Jesus took the longest journey to be with you right now to make a difference in your life and in your situation. And so right now, before we sing, we're just going to pray, okay? And some of you, you just need to pray for yourselves. 
But you know what? I think some of us this morning, we can pray for one another. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but this is important this morning. So before you close your eyes, we're going to do what the Bible says, which is we bear one another's burdens. If you say, I need the help of Jesus this morning, I really do, just raise your hand, and we're going to pray together. Just raise your hand. It's okay. Whatever it is, you just, just raise your hand. It doesn't matter. That's right. We're not putting anybody on the spot. My hand is raised as well. Okay, would you look around? If somebody is near you, you can pray for one another. It's okay. Some of you, you may want to move around the room. Some of you may say, uh, <laughs> some of us are a little bit shy about that. That's okay, because Jesus is with us this morning. So, be, so you can just be playing, but we're going to pray first, okay? And if, so, if you're around somebody, can we just, if you, you can hold somebody's hand. If you're next to somebody, you can hold each other's hand. Some of you are in the same situation. Somebody may be in front of you. You can just put a hand on their shoulder or, or just, can we do that first? Oh, this is a better Christmas gift than anything. It really is. It's a better Christmas gift than anything. Just pray for one another this morning and then we're going to sing, okay? And you, let's, just, let's just come to the Lord right now. Jesus, we come to you right now every one of us. Lord, all around us, people are rejoicing and they're singing happy songs this Christmas. But oh God, for some of us this morning, our hearts are breaking and heavy and we have no joy and we have no answer. And so where we are in our darkness, in our brokenness, in the manger of our lives where it is smelly, and dark and not very clean, we say very simply this morning, Jesus, 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 make the journey again to our hearts, to our lives. Would you come into our families this morning? And would you make a difference? Would you change the hearts of our children? Would you draw them to you and back to us? We pray for our parents. We pray for our brothers and our sisters. We pray for our husbands. We pray for our wives. We pray for our friends. We pray for our family members. Jesus, Jesus, would you be Emmanuel? Oh, if you took the journey from heaven to earth, then make, make us see and realize that journey again this morning in our hearts and in our lives. Would you make a difference? Would you make a difference? Give us hope as we look to you and as we call out to you this morning. Thank you, Jesus.